So um, I guess we want to start by uh, laying out the different kinds of groups that we need to be thinking about with this issue right now. So first off, just the, the difference between a pack and a super pack, right? And okay. Dave really knows this stuff. Yes. Uh, so I mean, so you, you hear the term super pack thrown around a lot lately in the media, and, and what and it's, what what is that, and what's a pack? So a pack has, and, and, and Dr. Lawrence referenced McCain Feingold, that was the created to 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 fix PACs from having unregulated money and, it, and, and doing things. But in doing so, they opened up a whole floodgate of things now and, and laws and some different court decisions um, that I will leave out to the really smart people to, to, <laughs> to cite, uh, to Dr. Glenn. Uh, I'll, I'll go with that one. He's good on the law. So, but a super PAC is a new thing that was created in 2010 um, that allows candidates to do just about whatever they want, or not candidates, I'm sorry, uh, committees to do whatever they want, but they're not allowed to connect with the campaign. Um, the, the, actually, I have a good friend of mine who works at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, and they have an independent, independent expenditure side. And by the way, I'm just going to say this right now. I'm, if, if I use words that you don't know or date it pop culture references, just raise your hand, and, and, <laughs> I'll, and I'll come back to those. Um, so. So, but the, the DCCC has—they've literally built a wall in their office mm. so that they so that people cannot cross over into the independent expenditure side. But what but what that means is, the the money that comes in independent expenditure can be used to to do and say a lot of different things. But you can't coordinate with a candidate. You can so it could be, I could we'll use this example here. I could say that, you know, don't take Dr. Spicer's classes next year. Um, <laughs> But I don't know. But I'm not. But I'm not. I'm not with another communications department faculty. Mm -hmm. I don't know him. So, right. so that's kind of the big difference, I think. And then you know, and 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 in the the slide here kind of lays it out. Um, you know, the vote for Hillary versus ready right. for Hillary. So there, there's a Hillary Clinton has a pack called or or had a pack called uh, Vote Hillary Pack, which uh, her campaign was in charge of. It was explicitly connected to the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2008. But recently, probably the most high-profile super PAC in the news right now is called Ready for Hillary. And it's just a group of people who, wink, wink, have nothing to do with Hillary Clinton. They just really like her and want people to support her. So they started this Ready for Hillary super PAC. Um, and that's the difference between these two, right? The, the limited fundraising on the PAC side, uh, the idea that it's connected to the candidate explicitly versus the super PAC, which can raise as much money as they want um, and uh, cannot coordinate with the candidate. Campaign. Right. Um, part of how these come out too is that, uh, and Dave might know a little bit more about the mechanics of this, but uh, you know, uh, yesterday there were a lot of Democrats standing around with no jobs anymore, uh, and they probably had money left over in their campaign funds. So one of the things that a losing candidate does at the end of the campaign is to take all that leftover money and move it into a PAC, into a political action committee, or to now into a super PAC. And then they can use that money to continue to have some influence over the process by spreading it around to other candidates. And, and, and mm -hmm. frankly, it's more, it's more often the case that it's a retiring um, right. member who, who mm -hmm. has the money in there. If, if you lost your campaign, you likely have to go. I, I actually have a dear friend of mine I have to go write a check for for debt relief tomorrow yeah um, because they, 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 the losing candidates often don't have money but but uh, uh, S Senator Harkin for example in mm -hmm. Iowa has a bunch of money left over and I think I think he's going to maintain and be a political player in the in the years to come because Through of the amount money, of money yeah. he has left over that he did not spend this this election cycle and, and is now retired so mm -hmm. I think that will be interesting um, one thing yeah. on the super PAC so go ahead oh no, sorry no, go this, ahead. Is, you, this actually works out great yeah um, so this is this is the kind of where it's going. So they can raise unlimited amounts of money. This is where you hear about George Soros and the Koch brothers and the and 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 you know Bill Maher even now you know give, you know. Mm -hmm. But it, but the reason you know those names is because super PACs, you have to disclose the donors. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in the case of super PACs, I, I kind of find this to be a fun fact about them. It's it's it, they're ego driven almost with 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 the with the donors. Yeah. They they'd like to be known that they're doing it. The Koch brothers, you know, they they try to have their secret dark money and. And by the way, I'm going to just preface this. And if I pick on if I pick on uh, Republicans too much, I'm going to apologize. I, I, <laughs> I'm a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> I, I've worked for Democratic camp campaigns for quite a while, so so I'm, I'm going to try to be balanced in my attacks, but mm -hmm. and, and not always focus on the Koch brothers. But I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to Soros when I can. Um, but the the so but but those names are they're attached. The donations are attached. The donations from, you know, from the the Teamsters Union could give 
a, 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 you know, as much money as they want to give to, to ready, ready for, for Hillary. Hillary. Yeah. But mm -hmm. they can only give $5,000 to vote Hillary PAC. Vote Hillary PAC. Right. So, and just to be clear, when we say the term independent expenditure, uh, what that means is any kind of money that's spent to advance the message, vote for candidate X or vote against candidate X. Mm -hmm. Any kind of message like that is an independent expenditure. Right. So uh, what, one of the things that uh, we wanted to include in this presentation is to give you some background on what we just went through uh, and what just ended on Tuesday. So uh, in this, uh, the last numbers for this year anyway, they're pro these are probably gonna be updated, but the most updated numbers for this year is that there were uh, 1,236 super PACs involved in the uh, 2014 election that did some kind of fundraising and spending and they uh, raised 593.7 million dollars and spent 339.3 million dollars just from the super PACs. That doesn't include the actual campaigns themselves, uh, the the DCCC, the the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee, all those actual like party organizations. This is just the money that was spent by the super PACs this year uh, to advance their can candidates. And I'm, and I'm certain that I mean the numbers are going to go up drastically. There was there was a when, th this year this year there was a tremendous yeah. late push. Uh, once everyone saw the, the handwriting on the wall, um, I, I I actually think that you know. Fundraisers can do a better job of predicting elections than Nate Silver. Um, <laughs> we 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 know we I, I can look at an election, you know, a couple weeks out and say, okay, where's where where's their money coming from? Is the is where where's the the, the quote smart money, the lobbyist money coming from? And, and I you know I saw I saw a big push late in the election this year, and I said mm -hmm. I said it, and I yeah I said I said it could get right. to 53 or 54 seats in the Senate and everyone was think, telling me I was wrong and so I didn't realize this screen was going to be so white on my on my computer screen it's gray with white text but just so you know what these numbers are um, 161.9 this means a super PAC that spent money criticizing Republicans 161.9 million uh, the red pie piece 35 million dollars of super PACs who were supporting Democrats uh, the green in the middle there is $78 million against Democrats, and the dark green is $55.1 million for Republicans, for Super PAC Republicans. So you can see, um, if, if, we're, if we're really uh, like breaking it down by partisanship, you can see the, the Democrats are beating the Republicans, at least this year, beat the Republicans in terms of Super PACs. Right? So we have this broken down. This is the um, favorable, so this is the amount of uh, pro-Democrat super PACs and anti-Republican, pro-Republican, anti-Democrat, and you can see 196.9 on the Democrat side and 133.1 on the Republican side this year, okay? Uh, the saddest part of that graph, I think, is the enormous size of the anti. The negative message is beating the positive message um, significantly. And, and, that's, and that's what, the, I mean, mm -hmm. these, these, the, and we're gonna get to 501c4s in a little bit, but these these allow these the, the super PACs create cover for for people. Uh, you, yeah. I mean, you guys are all familiar when you hear at the end of a political ad, "My name is so and so, and I approve this message." They don't have to say that now in negative ads because that's why that language was created was so that so that people would be accountable for their words and what they said. You know, so you know, I think yeah. I think um, I think the Baltimore Ravens stink. Uh, my name is Dave O'Donnell, and I approve that message. But now, now we're both Steelers fans. We're both by Steelers fans. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but, but now, but now, but, but 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 now I could have my super PAC come out and say that Joe Flacco only has one eyebrow, and, uh, <laughs> and but but I'm not but I'm not accountable to that. I know nothing about that ad, about yeah. my feelings about the Baltimore and, Ravens. And there'll be no blowback on Dave. There'll for be no that blowback message. on me for that. It'll, one. it'll all be because of the uh, Joe Flacco has one eyebrow right. super PAC. Right. Right. Yeah. I, the, uh, I might start that. <laughs> um, one way that this, that this issue really ties into inequality as, as, a, as a problem is with this, the single candidate super PACs. So this year there were 94 super PACs that were just for one candidate. So a super PAC can be about an issue, right? You, you, can, you can be focused on a particular issue and then spend your money supporting many candidates around the country uh, who are in support of your position on that issue. The single candidate super PAC, 94 of them, um, raising 54.9 million and spending uh, 51.4, almost 51.5 million dollars just to support a single candidate. So part of the problem here is that it becomes outrageously expensive to run for office. 
Um, and we saw that, we, you know, 2012, there was an Obama super PAC, there was a Romney super PAC. You can't run for president without a super PAC now. And you probably can't run for most offices without a super PAC at this point. Certainly it's, Senate. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, and, I mean, anything statewide or, mm -hmm. I mean, Senate is, yeah, you, you absolutely have to have, you know, the, that, kind of, that kind of resource. I mean, we look, I mean, um, when, you, when you look at, at the, just the, I mean, and it's, it's a, the, the skyrocketing amount of, fundraising in, in recent years. I mean, with the rise of media and television, the, um, you know, the fact that we just had 100, I mean, the, when, when the dust settles in North Carolina, that race will have, they will, they will have raised and spent $100 million on a Senate race in North Carolina. Um, I mean, and, 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 and you know, I, I, I will, you know, Dr. Spicer and I did a, we worked on a campaign one time for a prospective United States Senate candidate. Yeah. <laughs> and we put together our dream budget you know, that was going to take this little known guy to get to the Senate. Our dream budget for that, from where for primary in general, was about six million, and that was and that was and that was a lofty goal. Uh, yeah. in, 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 at that time, and, and now we're now we're looking at a hundred million dollars to win and a Senate race. That, and, and, that's, and that's not going to change. That's ten years ago that now, right? That was ten years ago, yes. And so that that would be chump change today. Yes, you could, you that's, I mean, that's you don't you can you you probably couldn't run for a competitive house seat on that money. And we, we should also note that the, depending on where you're running, it, it, yes. it varies. Like Pennsylvania, you have the Philadelphia media market, the Pittsburgh media market. Uh, those, those are expensive media markets to, to buy airtime, and that's a big part of the problem. And, and that's actually becoming an issue. I mean, I, I think you, we saw the, 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 you know, the results in, in the Washington, D.C. area in, in, in um, the, the Maryland governor's race and the Virginia Senate race. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a lot closer than they normally would be, yeah. Because it's DC, the DC media market, DC mm -hmm. Baltimore media market. They're two separate markets. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> really expensive to buy in, and mm -hmm. and that creates a, you know, it, you know, there, there's only so many resources you can do. Um, I, I don't know how closely you guys follow it. There was a candidate for this was for Congress in 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 Northern Virginia. And he made a really, really bad comment talking about that his, his Republican opponent had never had a real job in her life. And she had. And that was, that's, that's, yeah. that's neither here nor there. Um, but because, you know, that market is so expensive, the, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee pulled out of that race, you know, as soon as he made that comment because they had, I mean, it, it's such an, had he made that comment in Johnstown, Pennsylvania? Um, he might have survived. They might have yeah. survived a little bit because they can keep the money, but they can't keep money flow. As much money is going to need to flow to to right. to, 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 to bite to, to bring that back. So yeah. So we we covered you know political action committees, su uh, super PACs. The the sort of dinosaur of the uh, of the process is the five twenty seven. <coughs> okay. And go ahead. Um, yeah. And, and five, so five twenty sevens are I, I I think again I'm hoping this isn't a dated reference, but in two thousand four there was the, the the most famous one was the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. And it was a group of people who attacked uh, then Senator Kerry, who was running for for, for president at the time, uh, with his his the, the the men who served with him in Vietnam. And and so, but they and it became a thing. And that, that's where people start really paying attention to five twenty sevens. And mm -hmm. but because five twenty, we're going to get into why five twenty sevens went away here in a second, or or the impact of five twenty sevens went away. Um, was that that you do have to disclose all of your donors, but it's uh, it's unlimited money, but you do have to disclose who's paying for it, who's doing right. this, and, and and it they're they're actually under it's a it's a it's an election law more so than a tax law, and mm -hmm. that's where we can get into it in a second. And they, if if say you have a five twenty seven, and all you want to do is spend your money to uh, do some voter registration drives or to talk about a particular issue, you can raise unlimited amount of money. You don't disclose if you get into advocating for or against a particular candidate, that's when disclosure becomes right. an issue Thank for the 527. That's, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but they're becoming less useful now because of the rise of super PACs and the rise of the, the next category that we'll get into, which is the 501Cs. And, and, we, and we decided they were, the, they're kind of like the, the, the laser disc, but I even would think CDs, you know, where they were, where even they were very useful for a while, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. now, but now you can have a thousand songs on your iPod, so. Yeah. So if yeah, if, if super if uh, 527s are CDs, uh, 501c3s are iPhones. Yeah. 501c3s yeah. might actually be uh, already like the injected uh, uh, when you when right. some, someday when we all have uh, little microchips injected into our arms that uh, instantly stream music to our ears biologically. That's what 501c's are. Yes. Uh, just b before we move into the 501c's, 
there were still 492 527s involved in this election, which you see that's less than half of, of the uh, uh, super PACs. Um, and only in the, the four, 418.3. I mean, they're still raising more and they're still spending about the same amount of money, but they're on their way out. Uh, so the 501Cs, this is a different kind of animal now. Yeah, so, so, and this is this, so 501C3 <coughs> is, you know, they're, they're, these are the nonprofit organizations that, you know, and, and it can be something as innocuous as the Humane Society. Um, the NRA. The NRA or, mm -hmm. you know, something, you know. Sierra Club. Sierra Club or, mm -hmm. or, you know, something more drastic like the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. Um, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's what, what it is. So, but, but you can do, and, and I'm going to disagree a little bit with the slide, but so it's mostly politics are off limit, but you're an education group. You're able to say, so, so what my organization does is we have a, we have a computer model that, that simulates tax situations and, and we can take a bill and say, do this. So we get calls from folks in Harrisburg and they'll say, hey, there's a new tax bill coming down and, and we would like you guys to analyze it. So we put out an, an, an analysis of it and it's educational and that's what, what it's there for. It's not, we're not, we're not trying to, we're, we, are, we are frankly trying to persuade uh, by doing that, but we're doing it not, we're, we're not doing it to, to influence elections. And that's the big thing that, that C3s and C4s can't, big difference between 501c3s and c4s 501c3s cannot they can they can say that congressman so and so should do this or vote on this particular legislation but they can't say don't vote for congressman so or so because mm -hmm. he voted for this piece of legislation and that it opens up the door for for some sneaky things because you you might not be saying uh, vote for Congressman X for re-election, but right. if you say Congressman X voted against the uh, Protect All Puppies bill, right. you're, you know what the uh, in subtext of that message is going to be. <laughs> and Congressman X is a Republican, clearly, yeah. and that's in, that, in that situation. I, so so I, that, that was my partisanship for the day. The, the 501c4s, they're, they're also referred to as social welfare organizations. And, and I think mm -hmm. when you look at any definition, when and if, go home and Google this if you are this nerdy and want to do this. Um, you will find quotes around social welfare. On yes. Any, in any, in any definition you find of it, there, there are quotes of, around, the, around the term social welfare. Uh, probably the, I put in the, the definition of a social welfare organization is one that must operate primarily to further the common good and general welfare of the people of the community, such as by bringing about civic betterment and social improvements. That is the exact wording in the tax code. And, Go ahead. Oh, yeah. and, and, I mean, and these are not, this is ironic, I mean, you know, we talked about 527s being dinosaurs, 501Cs are, are old. I mean, these, are, these have been around yeah. since the early 1900s mm -hmm. um, to, to govern these things. And again, the, you know, and again, the, the really smart people, lobbyists are really smart people. I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> they've, they've, they've figured out ways around laws that, that, you know, that, that even lawyers couldn't even imagine coming up with. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's where these have come in. Is, and, and it started at the, you know, during the during the, the, the post-McCain-Feingold, you know, reforms that everyone said, okay, we gotta come up with a different way to do this. And, and at that time, I actually went to work for an organization in Washington that was in the process of switching from being a PAC to becoming a, a 501c4 with a 501c3 attached to it. And, and because we, the, there was the opportunity there to influence policy based on, on that, and we were taking donations from, you know, groups such as General Electric and uh, mm -hmm. Apple and Microsoft and you know all the corporate money that, that, that you know that we're, we're going to get into this a little bit but but they but they are able to get they are able to give freely to those groups and then those groups work closely with elected officials mm -hmm. to help them influence policy um, mm -hmm. you know I, I tell the story of our my my boss decided to change his position on intellectual property because Real Networks had a really big check for us. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was, that was kind of where I started to update my resume. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but at the same time, we were trying to create a 501c3 organization to, mm -hmm. again, it, you know, and, and there's no difference between what we were doing and, you know, you hear about the Heritage Foundation and the Center for American mm -hmm. Progress and, you know, these, you know, Media Matters and these big groups, and they're all essentially doing this same thing. And it's, so it's not, it's not Democrats or Republicans, it's, Everyone has figured out their, uh, this loophole in, in the law. I mean, 501c4 groups were, you know, the, uh, you know, again, civic organizations. So it was, 
you know, the, the Chambers of Commerce, and the Lancaster County Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. would be, you know. Uh, and the, the, I mean, your definition of social good or common good or general welfare is really subjective, and this is part of the problem. It's, it's not clearly defined. So you could say, uh, my definition of uh, community good and general welfare is that I think there need to be more oil rigs around and uh, we need to be uh, drilling for more and having more fracking. Fracking is a social good and I know that there are a lot of people in Lancaster County that would hear that and say no yeah. that is not a social good at all but these groups would uh, spend their money to advocate that. And, and, because, and because they have fun educational sounding names and, and they're educational groups, especially the C3 side of things, they are you know they, they basically add credibility to someone's mm -hmm. position you know that mm -hmm. you know candidate x stands by fracking and and th this group comes in and writes an op-ed that says fracking is good here's mm -hmm. all the great things about fracking so they, right. they provide the they provide the, the the cover for these groups to do this type of work so in order to to have this standing in the tax code you have to have less than half of what you do be political campaigning so 51% um, or 50.1% of what you do has to be non-political campaigning activities. Um, and they're, this is the big problem, that they're not re required to disclose any of their donors. They don't have to tell where the money comes from. And that's the, the and, really troubling part. And so the way around this, by the way, for people looking for career ambitions here, um, 501c4s pay really well. <laughs> uh, because because you're, you're not, because they need to change the, the balance of their their money to right to to you know so you know they you know if you, if you spend ten million dollars on ads you have to spend ten million and one dollar on salary on and salary everything and else. Yeah. rent and everything like that so they've become really lucrative I mean and, and people get and it's you know <laughs> um, I, I work for an, my, by the way my organization doesn't do a lot of election stuff like this we we're, were pretty like that and we don't get paid real well but the, uh, <laughs> but 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 other ones. I mean, this is where you know the NRA, the AFL-CIO. I mean, all the and you know, however, I guess AFL is a bad example. But but mm -hmm. we'll have that's that's a it's, it, for career ambitions. Good 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 thought to go so, into. So at the end of the year, the the five hundred one C force look at the math and then say, this is how many how this much uh, the bonus checks are going to be for it, this year. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. And I mean, it's yeah, that easy. It's 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 that easy. And I said back and and like even with the C three, you are allowed to do a certain amount of lobbying um, you're not really allowed to call it lobbying but there's a math there's a formula that I have to do once a year when we when it's we le legislative education there, that's exactly mm -hmm. the words we use yeah. um, but we have to do a formula that each year the IRS comes up with a different percentage and we put it plug it in and it becomes you know that's the amount of money we're allowed to spend on on lobbying and I could say that we've never even scratched that number it's I mean it be, because it gets it's so there's so much you can do, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, and lobbying is essentially me going to a congressman's office and saying, hey, take a look at this, this paper we just wrote. Um, you know, they don't take us very seriously because we don't have any money to give them behind it. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so in, a, in the last election, the uh, 501Cs, this is where the Republicans catch up to the Democrats and they, they balance out the, the, imbalance in uh, super PAC money between the Democrats and the Republicans, the Republicans make up for in the 501c4s. So you see uh, and from this chart, $66.3 million against Democrats, 53.9 for Republicans. So this part of the pie is all of the non-disclosed money that went for Republican groups and candidates in this year's election. The other two pieces are Democratic groups and they are uh, 17 million for Democrats, 24.9 million against Republicans. So 17 and 24.9, and again, the, the, negative, the negative numbers win. Um, and just to see this laid out in a, a slightly different way, this, this is the, the number of millions, the millions of dollars that were spent, so you can see side by side. The super PACs still have them beat, 330 million to 162.1. Uh, but you see also over here the balance, the Republicans did a little more spending this time around. And just like Dave said earlier, the, the donor money is a better predictor of who's going to win than the polling money, right? Because you watch where the donor money is going because everybody is saying, who's going to be in office next year? I better make sure that I grease the right palm. Right. And, and, that's, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, and, that's, and, 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 and I imagine that these, again, these numbers are going to go up 
once we get through discussion. Yeah, um, right. And the, you know, the, the, and the other thing back to super PACs is, and this is, you know, they, can, they, can, they get to choose whether they disclose weekly or quarterly. I'm going mm -hmm. to just, I want everyone to just take a guess of which one they choose. To <laughs> uh, yeah. It's quarterly, because that way, that way after the election, all of it, it no one cares. It's, it's, it's dead news. And, and right. But, but yeah, lot, lots of money was flowing. Um, I, I, in, my, in the book, you'll see I'm on the board of the National Democratic Club, and it was a sad couple weeks there because no one was coming to our club. They were all going to the Republican Club <laughs> to give them money and not coming to give our candidates money. Right. So uh, li like Dave said, so like, all of these numbers are going to be bigger uh, late January, it, early February. I think they'll remain accurate. I think you might see a little, you know, probably a 5 to 10 percent jump on the Republican side, mm -hmm. but, but I think that they, they're very reflective of what happened this time around. Right, and again, just to see uh, the, the numbers, the anti and pro, the, the difference between, uh, the, the negative message is winning. The negative message is winning the, the dollar race over the positive message. Um, so did you want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the practical and like work experience, and then I'll jump back in and talk yeah. about my, my paper? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, I, I just, I said, I told the story about real networks earlier, and, 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 it, and anyway, are you guys familiar with corporate inversions? Have you heard about that? They, what you know, companies moving and buying companies in other countries so they can do it, and uh, I, I personally am looking forward to my Tim Hortons glazed double whopper. But that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm against them doing that, but 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 I'm looking forward to eating one of those someday. I, I enjoy gross food, but the uh, I still eat like a college kid. Uh, <laughs> so the so but with that with that stuff, this year we were doing a project um, on inversion, and a pharmaceutical company was doing a hostile takeover, which is not a term you hear much anymore. That doesn't, that doesn't happen very much. And they were trying to take over a company that was based in the United Kingdom because they wanted to move there for their lower tax rate. And our organization, as we do, came out and said, this, this is wrong and we don't, we don't want this and this is bad. And we got a phone call from a, from a lobbyist and they said, we want to, they said, they said, we'd like to write you guys a check and so you can keep doing this work. And we, and, and I said, I'm still running Windows XP on my computer, which was probably outdated before you guys even got to junior high. <laughs> uh, but the uh, and I, I said, wait, and I, so I said, well, we could use some money, but we're not we're not going to take corporate money. But that's the kind of way these are work. That's the kind of way these things are working now. Is that you know the 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 corporations and the, and the lobbyists are giving money to nonprofits because they can't give directly to candidates anymore. It, it gets really hard mm -hmm. to walk up to a candidate and do do things anymore after Abscam, which. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> are you are you allowed to to finish that story and say why that guy wanted to write you that check? The 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 check about uh we we want you to keep doing that research oh, right. saying that that merger right. is bad. Are you allowed to tell that story? Yeah, absolutely. I okay. could, I mean, maybe that's, so, <laughs> this so, is a great end to the story. I, lo I love the way this ends. Yeah. So, so the the so they came and said they offered us a couple hundred thousand dollars to do this and and we said we kept saying no and we kept saying no and they kept trying to give it to us in different ways and we kept saying no no we can't take that. And we just, just kind of ultimately decided that, that we were not going to accept any money, but we kept beating up on the company anyways. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there was a but better ending if the, I told you. The, uh, you. You said that the reason the guy wanted to write you that check was because he was part of oh, uh, right, their... Right. Oh, right, 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 right. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so the, one of the big reasons that, that, we, we, that they were trying to, inf they wanted to influence us was to drive up the stock price so that all the people who were working and had stocks in, in the other rival company when the hostile takeover was going on, would their, the stock price would rise uh, because we were bringing attention to it. So that was that was kind of the part. Sorry, I forgot that part. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, that's, yeah, that's it's, it's just a, a perfect illustration about about how money works behind the scenes yes. and how you you don't see it, how it's affecting something as simple as a stock price in the middle of a corporate merger. Right. And they, they, it, it almost seems like the kind of thing that two political opponents would do to undercut one another, right. but it's, it's not a political campaign, right. it's, it's business. It was, it was business, but, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was kind of an interesting thing. But, but I will say, I mean, you know, having been involved in, in campaign finance in various ways, shapes, and forms over the last long time, uh, I'm getting old. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to say, you know, as many years as it's been now, but uh, getting on to 20 years, it's, it's really been, it's really been a, interesting time to, to be a part of it because, I mean, there has been this drastic, I mean, as with everything lately, a drastic sea change going on of, of you know, whether it's in, in legislation. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that I just think are interesting with change, but, but the, the rapid up spiral of 
campaign money um, and the and the creative ways people are getting it now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we I think we covered a lot of that. And hopefully, if we if we have questions, we'll get to it. But I'm going to let the and well. But I mean, the the last point to add to that is that the this this drastic change is not necessarily rooted in recent years, right? It's not a, a totally new phenomenon. One, I think it was James Fallows told this story about the Kennedy-Nixon debate on, on television. Everybody's heard that story about uh, people who saw it on television thought Kennedy won and radio people thought Nixon won. And that, sort of, that story is sort of exaggerated um, and has become part of political legend. But one of the points that James Fallows makes was that what did come out of that was that uh, the politicians looked at television and saw the ultimate tool to get them elected. They saw, uh, you know, this is the way it's going to be in the future. They saw this this yeah. magical box, and the uh, television companies looked at the politicians and saw big bags of money, mm -hmm. um, and that's why we are where we are today. Right. And I mean, I think, yeah, and I, I think I think it's important to note that all of this money that we're that we're talking about, I'm, I would say, the vast vast majority mm -hmm. is spent on television ads. It's not on voter outreach. I mean, that is voter outreach, but it's not on it's. That, that's where that's where the money's going, and, and television's expensive. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that my brother didn't show up and hear me say that about <laughs> him. Yeah, he, so, yeah. so I'll let you. Great. So the the last part of this a, a, a paper that I, I've been working on. My dissertation was about uh, political deception. So I, I did this discourse analysis of uh, deception in politics, and one area of that is secrecy. Uh, that's one kind of deception, is hiding information. Um, and one way of hiding information is what we've been talking about with non-disclosure in um, donations. So the paper that I'm working on is coming at this from a slightly different angle, though. It's looking at um, how does that affect our uh, purchasing uh, decisions that we make when we go to buy things. It isn't just about knowing um, how the money gets spent, how, who donates to the campaign so you know who to vote for. It's also about thinking about uh, wh where, do, where am I going to go to shop uh, based upon certain beliefs that I have, certain principles that I have? I don't want to give my money to co company X because I don't want my money that I spent to buy a product to ultimately end up being put toward such and such cause, and I want to spend my money over here because I believe that this company uh, reflects my values. So one way, uh, a sort of concrete example of what I'm talking about is a, a few years ago, Target got in, uh, it's not even a few, it's well, maybe three or four now, Target got into a little trouble because they donated money to a group called Minnesota Forward. There's this political action committee in Minnesota that was supporting the Republican candidate for governor that year. Um, and the reason that they made that donation was because the Republican candidate for governor in Minnesota looked stronger. The Democrat didn't look like he was going to win that time, so they were basically just trying to sort of protect their, protect their interests economically. Now, Target has a reputation as being an LGBT-friendly corporation. Right. And just so you know, Target is based in Minnesota. That's why Minnesota is the state that uh, we're talking about. So they have this reputation through uh, their marketing. Their marketing has featured uh, same-sex couples, same-sex couples in um, wedding settings, same-sex couples with children, so same-sex dads uh, together. So they have this reputation as LGBT-friendly in their marketing and also in their treatment of their employees. They are, they are a, a corporation that gives same-sex benefits to uh, same-sex couples, to spouses. Uh, so they give health benefits and uh, recognize same-sex uh, relationships. So they have this sort of LGBT-friendly reputation, but they donated money to an anti-LGBT rights candidate. They didn't do it because they're hypocrites and they're trying to go against the, the sort of public advocacy of this stance. They did it because it was economically uh, in their best interest to do so. But when people found out, their employees, their internal public was upset about it. They said, you treat us one way, you, you treat us with respect, why would you give money to this uh, candidate that's not going to treat us with respect? Uh, and then their external publics, all of the, the people who shop at uh, Target in part because they are LGBT friendly said, you, you hold out this image of yourself and now you're giving money to this guy, why, why are you doing that? Why would you give money to that candidate? So corporations, part of the, the rationale between this sort of undisclosed uh, donor method of getting money out is that corporations want to be able to donate money to the candidates, grease the right palms without having any of the consequences of doing that, without having to pay the price for donating to a candidate or donating to a cause that people will, will be offended by. So what I'm looking at in my paper, the, the argument that I'm making is that dark money sits in this intersection between politics, law, and commerce. That that is what dark money is about. It's about the political process. It's about the legal process of 
freedom of speech because dealing with this, uh, we are going to, as Citizens United taught us, as the McCutcheon case taught us, we are going to bump up against the First Amendment, especially with the current uh, make of the Supreme Court. We are going to bump up against the First Amendment because uh, despite how you feel about this court, uh, in some ways it's very good on the First Amendment depending on your perspective, and in other ways it's not so good on the First Amendment. Um, and I've had uh, two instances now where I've had the uncomfortable uh, position of say, having to say the words, I really agree with Justice Alito in his dissent on this case, which uh, I've only said that word two times in my life, or that sentence two times in my life, and it was on First Amendment cases where he was the lone dissenting voice saying, the, the First Amendment does not protect this. This is uh, absurd. The, the one most high profile is U.S. v. Stevens, where uh, the, the court struck down a law that banned crush videos. Does anyone know what crush videos are? where people make videos of uh, women's shoes crushing and killing small animals um, and then post them to the web. And there was a law that was signed by President Clinton banning those videos. The law was challenged on First Amendment grounds and the Supreme Court, eight to one, Justice Alito being the, no the one, said First Amendment protects that. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, First Amendment uh, jurisprudence we're up against when we try to deal with dark money in a legal sense. And so commerce, uh, one of the things that I'm arguing, might be our last resort as citizens to fight against this sort of thing, to deal with this, to think about how we spend our money and to send the message to corporations, to businesses that we aren't going to spend our money here if our money is going to end up there, if our money is going to end up be doing something that we don't want it to do. So premise number one that we're up against is money equals speech. Uh, this is Jesse Unruh. He was the speaker of the California legislature when Ronald Reagan was governor. Um, Ronald Reagan's probably, I guess, his chief Democratic uh, opponent when he was governor of California. Um, and it's debated. I, I take the side that money is the mother's milk of politics. Jesse Unruh is the, the source of that. That's been debated. But um, money equals speech is the first premise. I'm not saying that because I agree with it. In fact, I, I strongly disagree with it. But this is the, the world in which we live in. So we have to deal with the fact that money is speech. The court has decided that it's speech. So we have to act accordingly and exercise our rights around that premise. Um, premise number two, anonymity in political speech is problematic. So to have any kind of political speech that's anonymous, I would make some minor uh, exceptions to this argument, but for the most part I would say it's antithetical to the basic premise of the First Amendment, that we have a, a sort of marketplace of ideas that people are allowed to uh, be engaged with the political process and share their ideas, but also know where those ideas are coming from and respond to them. And if speech is anonymous, uh, we, we cannot respond to it properly because we don't know the source of that information. So I go so far as to argue that uh, anonymous speech, at least in this form, the form of dark money, literally viol violates the liberty of every citizen. It's a violation of each one of our individual rights to live in that particular environment, to have that exercise in that way. Um, a third premise that's part of this that gets into the commerce is that we express our political beliefs in what we buy. So I really like uh, Zizek, uh, Slavoj Zizek and his example about Starbucks. Right? He's, he talks about the depoliticization of our culture. So we, we don't use political means to solve big social problems, uh, Zizek argues, because uh, we have it sort of baked into the cake of capitalism now. So you, you buy uh, something from Starbucks and uh, you know that uh, X percent of that, like that, a nickel of the $3 that you spent for that cup of coffee is going to go to save the rainforest. And you feel good about yourself because you bought a cup of coffee that will help save the rainforest. Or you buy a pair of shoes and that shoe company, for every pair they sell, they donate a pair to underprivileged children. And you feel good about yourself for buying that pair of shoes or that pair of glasses. So it's sort of baked into the cake that we, we don't solve big political problems through our big uh, social problems through political means. We solve them through commerce now. And uh, that, that, I would say, it's, it's good that uh, underprivileged children or children who need it will get a free pair of shoes. That's wonderful, but that isn't the best way to solve the problem of poverty, I would argue. Uh, and then uh, the last part of this, the last element, is cons conspicuous consumption, right? The idea that we buy things as an expression of our political beliefs, not just to make ourselves feel good, but to say to the world, hey, this is who I am. This, this is what I believe. So uh, things like there was a, a, a 
twin brother and sister who are economics PhD students, um, one at University of Minnesota and one at uh, USC, I think. Um, and they co-authored this paper on the Prius. And they looked at why is it that the Prius sells so much better than the Honda Civic Hybrid and the, uh, I think the Kia Hybrid, or the, the Ford, the Ford Hybrid is, was the third one that they looked at. And they took the state of uh, Washington and the state of Colorado and they designated certain areas of each state as green areas, areas that are uh, liberal in their political beliefs and have lots of people who are, are strong environmental advocates in that area. And they found a statistically significant difference in sales between the Prius and the other two brands of hybrid in those areas of, of the states. In the other parts of the states, uh, across the board sales were pretty much the same. And they make the argument that the Prius outwardly is a hybrid. When you see a Prius, you look at it and you say, that's a hybrid. When you see a Honda Civic hybrid, it could be a regular Honda Civic or it could be a hybrid. You don't know just by looking at it. And the same thing with the Ford hybrid. So what their argument is, and they have data to, to sort of support their argument, is that people, buy, people in these areas buy the Prius because they want the rest of the world to know I'm green. Okay, so we express our political beliefs through the things that we buy. So we need to think about that as uh, where, where does our money then end up once we make that purchase? So this becomes part of, of why we make our purchases. Um, premise number four is that uh, about political donations and informed consumers. Knowing how political donations are made and spent is not just about being an informed voter, it's about being an informed consumer. Um, is uh, the, the kind of crux of my argument, right? You, you, you can't be an informed consumer unless you know where your money is ultimately going to end up. Um, and then my last premise of my paper, my last point, is that um, people have to be held accountable for their speech. So a uh, recent example of this, Campbell Brown was on uh, Stephen Colbert's show, show earlier this year, and she is uh, in charge of a, I, I think it's a super PAC, I can't remember if it's a super PAC or a 501C, the, the anti-teachers union group that Campbell Brown is, is it a super PAC or super PAC, super PAC. okay. So uh, Stephen Colbert sort of, during the course of the interview, poked her about who's giving you your money, where's your money coming from? And the, the transcript is kind of funny because he says, how much money have you raised? We haven't raised any money yet. Uh, the lawyers are doing a pro bono. So you aren't raising money. Oh no, we are raising money. Who are your donors? So she completely contradicted herself in the middle of the interview, but her response was that there were protesters in front of uh, the studio that day when she showed up, protesters who were opposed to her um, uh, group. And she said, the people who were outside today trying to protest they're also going after people who are funding this, and I think this is a good cause and an important cause, and if someone wants to contribute to this cause without having to put their name on it so they become a target, then I respect that. And I look at that and I say, I do not respect that. If, you're, if you are willing to say something, but you will only say it as long as you can say it anonymously, I have to say, I don't respect that. That's not something to be respected. So this is, she is basically outwardly, explicitly admitting that the reason that we do this is so that people are able to donate to causes and not have to pay the consequences of speaking their mind, of, of advocating something. Um, and that's my final premise of, of my argument, that anonymous political speech is speech that cannot be held accountable. It is freedom without consequences. If freedom of speech is, is a basic good, I, I accept that argument wholeheartedly, but freedom of speech with no consequences is not a basic good, and that would be the, the, the last point that I make. Um, just to, to make, uh, let everyone know, for everything that we talked about today, all this stuff, um, I have a, a delicious bookmark page and I, I made the tag dark money MU for this presentation. All of the data that we presented, all of the definitions, um, if you go to that URL, you'll find links to all that stuff that uh, I've posted on my uh, delicious bookmark page. So if you're, you're interested in more, or you can email me and I'll send you a link to that. So um, did you have anything else to? You, no, I really wanted to just kind of respond to, you know, mm -hmm. with, with the, the last slide there with, with, the, with the money and, 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 and the corporate stuff uh, mm -hmm. of, 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 of funding. Um, you know, and, it, and I live in Washington D.C. It's it gets to be a tad ridiculous of the, you know looking at the lists of things I can and can't eat anymore because I you know they, they give to the wrong cause or they're involved uh, with yeah. the wrong thing. I I I, uh, I still like a Whopper um, despite this despite the fact that, uh, that that they're not good for me one and two they're they're trying to you know steal American tax dollars. Um, <laughs> but the 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 the. It, but I think I think you know that the, the last slide that really illustrates the, the the dangers coming 
and looming with with the 501c4s. This is, I mean, this is a new thing. This is this is this is a, this is new new territory that we haven't crossed, and it's and it and, and, and unfortunately, it's not new law. It's it's codified law that's been over a hundred years. It's over a hundred years old. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's it's not something that's going to change. It's just people finally got got wise to how they can use this. And it, I mean, and the 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 it did happen overnight. This is this, again. I've been part of this since I started in Washington. It's 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 a it's an ongoing thing, and, and you, you know you, you back it up. But you know when when you when you uh, the difference between a pack and a think tank. I mean, in in, yeah. any, in anyone's mind mm-hmm. is 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 it's. I mean, think tanks are, are heady and wonderful things, and uh, I my my friends in Dubois laugh when I say that because they don't they can't quite understand what a think tank is yet. They they haven't wrapped their head around that idea. Uh, but but I think it's important when you're when you're looking at stuff from think tanks, including mine. Um, and other ones that I might agree with or have worked for at various times in my life, to really think critically about where where they're getting their money. I mean, these you know they're not they're not out there for you know that someone has to pay for that, and 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 I think it's important to look at who's paying for that. You know, mm-hmm. you know the um, I mean I, I'm I'm trying to come up with a, a good example of a the, the United States Chamber of Commerce. Mm-hmm. You know that sounds great. I mean, you know the United States Chamber of Commerce. That that sounds wonderful. That's a that's a great sounding organization. Honorable. Honorable. Like, yeah. Sounds strong and sounds strong. yeah. Uh-huh. But they are they're very. I mean, they have they have developed a very partisan ish message. You know, they'll say nonprofit, but again, because you have that name attached to it, it's important to look at. You know, the 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 Center for Defense Studies is another one. I mean, to, you know, to really think of it, and, and you know, they, they've been that was in the push towards recently. You know, boots on the ground, reengaging in, in uh-huh. you know, with in, in the Middle East and this and that. But when you look at who their funders are, it's McDonnell Douglas, uh, <laughs> Boeing. You know, yeah. you know, the 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 you know the the big the big funders that would that would that would benefit greatly from that. So I think that's what I guess would be my takeaway from this is to, you know, when you when you when you see something always, you know, you're Millersville students and you know it's a big government campus here. I, I went here. You're always critical and thinking, so so I don't have to tell you much to do that. But just just keep your eyes open on that, you know, and and, and to um, be 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 be, uh, be be nervous about anything you read from a think tank. You know? Yeah, I wanted to to touch on one thing that you you did say, Dave, and I have this quote to just to acknowledge one weakness in in my argument, and I'm I'm still working through this paper, but like you said, right? I can't decide. I can't not eat somewhere all the time. Um, I remember when, when the, uh, the Chick-fil-A thing was happening, my, my sister called me up and she, she said, do, do I have to stop eating Chick-fil-A? Do I really have to? <laughs> she loves it. She loves it so much. She was like, but I don't want to spend my money. I said, Gene, really, if you have a chicken sandwich every once in a while there, it's not going to end gay rights forever. I th- I think we'll. I think we'll live. I, I, I actually, on that same point, I was. I had some friends of mine who were having the same thing. I actually don't like Chick Fil A. I, I, my my, my Chick Fil A like is just. It's just. I just. Don't, I know. I know. I know. I'm. I'm. I'm in the minority here, but I. I can. I talked to 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 a, to a friend of mine who was all upset about this. I said, No, no. Here's what you have to do. You make Chick Fil A the most LGBT restaurant in the country. You know, I, I want. I mean, have 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 weddings there. Uh, you know, the, you know that's that's the way to make change. Not not through, uh, not 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 through, through through not eating there. Through, I mean, through boycotting them, yes. right? I mean, the Polynesian sauce just it just it just doesn't do it for me. The uh, um, Mike Mike Pesca is, is a journalist who works for Slate, and when the Chick Fil A thing was happening, this this quote I think really kind of sums up the the complexity of the problem of dealing with it in this way, and the the weakness that I acknowledge in my argument that I have to work through. He says, uh, three of my favorite restaurants are a Turkish place, a Greek place, and a diner owned by a Cypriot guy. I would say there's zero chance that those three have a uniformity of opinion, and therefore someone must disagree with me. But I would go insane and free frequently hungry if I were parsing the politics of everyone who peddles shawarma in this city. It's different, however, when a business hangs their belief on the walls, when you can't look away with it, and it seems that business, to some extent, has broken the compact with its customers. So there are two diff- you know, we, we can't think about and know about every detail of every company, but when a company hangs its opinion on the wall and says, oh, we don't like gay people, or, or even the other way, like, we don't want religious people here, you, you have to be able to say, okay, well, you, you've made it explicit, you've made it clear, now I'm going to take my money elsewhere. Right. Um, but 
uh, a statement of principle is different from I'm going to take my money that I've made from selling you stuff and give it to candidate X or cause X. Right. And I, and I, but I think we've become such a politicized, partisan society that I mean, and that's and that, this, part is, of the this, is, this has become a huge part of the problem. Um, that that you know that that people you know they're, they you know the, the the center for responsive politics. Mm -hmm. You know, I might get I always get acronyms wrong, so. <laughs> Um, the, you know, they'll, they'll publish the list of, you know, you know, this company's executives gave this much to Democrats, this much to Republicans. Uh, I have a, I have a, this is not related to corporate, but it's the same kind of that mindset of politics. My, my friend is a graduate student at the University of Maryland and we play golf together occasionally. And his father is coming to visit from Arkansas. And his father is, will not come to Maryland because he sees it as a blue state. <laughs> he, he is he is staying in Virginia. I don't know if anyone here familiar with Maryland geography. College Park is not terribly close to Virginia, and that's where that's where that's where my friend lives. But his dad is staying in Virginia. And I, I said the other day, I said, "You do, your dad does know that they have two Democratic senators, a Democratic governor." Uh, <laughs> it's a know, purple state, though. It's, it's a, a little bit safer it's for a, him. Well, it's, yeah, <laughs> and Maryland now is a Republican governor. Right? He said, "You know, he could stay yeah. a little closer to home now." But but that's but it's but, <laughs> but that's the hyper partisanship that has has created in, in and through the media and things like that that, that that have created these kind of problems of money and and, and it's a sort of self segregation that's yes. happening as a yeah. result of it too. Yeah. And um, th things like looking at what TV shows you watch and being able to predict which party you're going to vote for based on that that right. we self segregate in our right. culture or in our where we live and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I they, I would throw them off with that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess uh, should we should we move to the Q and A? Any yeah. any questions? Yeah. Please ask questions. <laughs> questions for the presenters. Anything about campaign finance? A million questions, but I'm not allowed to ask. <laughs> Go ahead. Two small points, Mike. I mean, I expressed to you my interest with a couple of issues of starting <coughs> an organization here in Pennsylvania. Based on what I want to do, I'm not sure if we should have it as strictly a PAC, a super PAC, or anything else. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it, it's confusing. I mean, we're entitled to millennials for a better Pennsylvania. Do, do, mm -hmm. do you anticipate ever receiving a contribution larger than $5,000 to this organization? After looking at your thing, I thought about that, and I was like, yeah, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I create a 501c4, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's the direction that it's going. I think that, and that's yeah. I said, I, you know, that the, the PAC money is going and, and doing that. But but um, I think I mean it's important to figure out what your goals are and what your what your what what you want to accomplish uh, with that. You know, is it to you know yeah. how how much that money do you want to hide? Uh, or, yeah. you know, you know. So so that's the that's the big big thing there. And, but yeah, I mean I think I think we're I think we're going to see um, you know the the last. I mean, when, you know, just just with the <laughs> the Democrats are always a little behind on these things. Um, you know, the super, the super PACs in the last midterm. Mm -hmm. So that was 2010. 10, right? Mm -hmm. Where where that was a new thing, and it was mostly Republican stuff. Well, now now the super PACs are the de they, by 2012, and, and 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 President Obama said he was I'm not going to create a super PAC, and he did. Yeah. And because because you have to. I mean, it's yep. you know, it's 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 like taking a knife to an NRA meeting. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that was my last part. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, you know, that, that you, you know, you need, you need to, you need to be competing on a level playing field with everyone. Yeah. And, um, and, and the only way to do that is to, do, you know, do what the other side's doing. You, you, you know, the, 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 the uh, I, I, I live in Washington D.C. and I always tell the joke of we, we just had an election there and several of my friends were upset that I didn't vote for kind of the. The, the new the new candidates the you know the, the, the against the establishment candidates I said, I said Washington works with a perfect amount of grift and corruption the city itself does so, you know, if you, if you if you want clean government move to Columbia Maryland um, <laughs> you know my 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 garbage gets picked up twice a week and 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 uh, the fire departments are pretty pretty accurate I don't have any kids so I'm not real concerned about the bad schools yet I'm, I'm at some point I'm, sh I'm sure that will change when, when you when have major league baseball now. I have major league baseball now thanks to the city um, things are looking pretty good we might get a new soccer stadium <laughs> go um, corruption you know, but but I mean but that's what I mean but there's but there's a but there's a certain amount of like level playing field that you have to you know you have to play on and that's why I think that you know we're gonna see the you know the 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 rise of the 
the, the, the C4 on the, on the Democratic side in yeah, the next two gonna, years. I forget who it was a, a long time ago that I was talking to or early in my political experience said Democrats can't, on principle we might not like these money things but we can't not do them because right. it would be unilateral disarmament. Right. It was, right. You, you can't, <laughs> you've got to play the game. Yeah, it's uh, you have you have a set of principles about how the process should work, and you have a set of principles in terms of the policies that you want to advocate. And if you uh, put all of your emphasis on the process principles, the other principles are never going to be advanced. And so, what what ha what have you won as as a result of that? Not to be sort of like. Uh, it's morally ambiguous or, or, or I, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I feel, I, you know. You, to, you'll, to, you'll be very proud of all your moral victories and never change anything. I, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. we ha I have a, just on, on this note, we, I have a, I'm involved with this program that we bring kids over from Ireland and, and this summer a kid lived with me and he was, I mean, you know, I thought I was liberal when I was 21 years old and, and, and you know, and being here at Miller's. Oren took me to a new level. I mean, he was, he was so against this and, and so the organization, um, that he came over on, they were running in the Marine Corps Marathon to raise money for the organization. And Oren, because he was so left of, I mean, he was left of the world. Um, <laughs> he, I, a quick funny story, but my neighbor next door to me is a kind of, I mean, she's, she's, she, she's a, like works for the Tea Party um, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fun little block. It's <laughs> DC, this is what people do there. We all, we all have some sort of political story. But, but so, so she meets Oren the first night and she says, she goes, what do you think of President Obama? And he said, I don't like him. And she's, she's so excited. She's, never been, she's, she's like, wait, I've got someone here next door. And, and, he goes, and she goes, why don't you like him? And he goes, he's not socialist enough for me. Uh, which, which blew this poor woman's head off. I mean, she, her head almost exploded because the concept of someone being more socialist than President Obama is just not, you know, it's, 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 just, it's just lost her. But, but, but he was, I mean, this goes into the consumption thing. He was upset that, that, that the Washington Ireland program was running in the Marine Corps Marathon. Uh, because they were supporting, you know, warmongering, and the Marine Corps Marathon breaks about even, from what I understand of their finances, from friends who work with that organization, and what money they do raise, it goes to like Toys for Tots. So I had to like calm him down on that one a little bit. But but, <laughs> but it is this idea, you know, this idea of what what you you know what you support is who you are, and, and that you mm -hmm. support the political activities of that thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, I don't like Chick-fil-A. That's a long-standing thing, but, uh, but... But it's just about the chicken. It's just about the chicken. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's about the chicken, I, you know. Well, it's about the chicken, you're right. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other questions, please? Fire away. I'm... Okay, well, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Yeah. And appreciate our, our guests also for the preparation. Yeah, the work thanks and for having the us. The travel as yeah. well. Oh, mm -hmm. this was great. Thank you very much. It's always, always a pleasure to come back to Millersville. <laughs>